How are we all doing today? Let's worship the Lord together, huh? It's all around us. We just have to open up our eyes and see it. There are so many blessings around us. God is everywhere around us. So let's just, as we sing this next song, let it just be a prayer that God will open the eyes of our hearts, that we will be able to just see him. And all the other things will, will fall away, but we can just have our eyes on him, especially right here.
shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. See you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy.
Father God, we thank you this morning. We praise you this morning for who you are and what you've done. And Father, we do thank you for your provision, for your faithfulness, your goodness in sending us your son, sending him here on a rescue mission for us so that we may have life. Father, we thank you for the greatest sacrifice of giving your son so that we can live through you, through him. Father, May we trust in the fact that even in, in moments of, of difficulty, even in moments of struggle, that Jesus is with us, that the Holy Spirit, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. Father, may we trust in the fact that we have all that we need in Christ to face whatever it is that this world may have for us. Father, may we cling to that truth forever and ever, and it's in Jesus' holy and precious name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. Why don't you go ahead and say hello, greet someone around you, welcome them to Grace Gospel Church this morning. Hey, buddy. All right, good morning, church. Good morning, good morning. Good morning, good morning. Welcome to Grace Gospel Church. We are so glad that you are with us on this Sunday morning. And I must say, everyone looks well rested. Um, <laughs> You look well-rested. You should be well-rested. Got an extra hour of sleep, all right? So we're all going to be alert all morning long during the message, uh, is what that means. So, uh, you know, welcome to Grace Gospel. We're glad you're with us. Uh, we do have welcome cards in every seat pocket in front of you, and uh, you are invited to fill that out. Um, and that's just a way that you can connect with us here at the church. 
uh, provides you a way to plug into our weekly newsletter we send out every Wednesday. Uh, or if you just have some information to update for us, you can fill that out and uh, you can place that in one of our offering boxes. There's one up here on the front wall and then one on the back wall uh, as you exit after service this morning. All right, we, while we are upstairs, uh, we do have two ministries that happen downstairs, and that is Kingdom Kids and Super Church. Kingdom Kids is newborn to preschool, and Super Church, there's two classes. Uh, one is kindergarten to second grade, and one is third grade through sixth grade. And so kids, you're now dismissed to go ahead down uh, for either of those ministries downstairs. All right, so a few other announcements, but first, uh, we got some uh, celebrating to do. Uh, Trunk or Treat was on Tuesday uh, this past week, and we had over 300 guests uh, come onto our property. Yes. It was a great day, our, our seventh annual Trunk or Treat, and uh, I just want to say thank you to everybody who played a role in making that happen. Uh, there's a lot of, of moving parts to make Trunk or Treat the success uh, that it is. And uh, so thank you for your role in that, whether it was just simply praying for the event or donating food and, or making homemade goodies for it or, or decorating a trunk or being here to serve that day. Just thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, it was a great event as we got to, to be the hands and feet of Jesus and, and shine the light of Jesus uh, in this community and beyond. So a uh, great day. And uh, man, we'll do it again next year for our eighth annual Trunk or Treat. But uh, this was a great year. So thank you again for being a part of that. Uh, coming up in just a couple weeks is our uh, family Thanksgiving dinner. So Sunday uh, the 19th, uh, that evening, you're invited to come out for our family Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, it's going to be a great time of fellowship, and uh, we, we've, we've kind of transitioned. Thanksgiving dinner used to be, uh, you know, as Danielle shared in the announcement a couple weeks ago, uh, it used to be something that just uh, all the all adults came to, all right? And now it's a family Thanksgiving. We, we want all the families to come. There's going to be upstairs uh, while we're eating and fellowshipping downstairs. Upstairs, there's going to be games and things like that uh, that you can, you can participate in with your kids. The kids can come up here and, and play uh, video games and board games and all sorts of activities. Uh, but downstairs, we're going to be uh, having our fa family Thanksgiving dinner and uh, it's going to be a great event, and so you're invited to come on out in two weeks. Uh, there is a sign-up sheet on the back table. Uh, the, the event itself starts at 5.30 uh, that evening. Again, the nursery will even be open for the young kids, and so uh, a family-friendly event that you are all invited to be a part of. You can sign up in the back to bring uh, a soup, uh, chicken nuggets, macaroni and cheese for the kids, uh, bread or dessert to share, so make sure you sign up accordingly, and uh, we look forward to a great day in a couple of weeks. All right, our, our ladies' Christmas brunch uh, is on its way, and this is a, this is a great event uh, for our ladies Saturday, December 9th from 10 uh, to 12.30, and there's a few things that you need to know uh, with that. Last week, we kind of just introduced um, the fact that this is coming and to put it on your radar, but the couple things uh, that you need to know. One, this is an evangelistic event, all right? The gospel is going to be shared, and uh, it's going to be an invitation for, for those that don't know Jesus to, to start a relationship with him. And so when you think through uh, your, your friends, family members, coworkers, whoever that might be, uh, think through in inviting someone that, that doesn't know the Lord, all right, or that might not come to church otherwise, but would come to uh, an event like this. And so you can invite them. Uh, the, the goal is of, of setting tables for the king, uh, King Jesus. We're gonna, they're going to have their, their finest china and things like that set up uh, in, in, in this room right here. And uh, it's going to be an awesome event, great food, and, uh, and a message is going to be shared uh, there. So uh, tickets are on sale starting today. They are $10.00. A person and seating is limited for this event, so please just make sure uh, that if you buy a ticket, maybe for a friend or someone uh, that you know for sure that they are coming, as uh, you know, seats are limited. And so we want to make sure everybody who has purchased the ticket will actually be here uh, for the event itself. So tickets on sale today. You can see uh, Miss Carol Cachetto in the back uh, for details with that. And then, of course, you know the different tables that we're having set up that day. We need uh, table hosts. All right, we're looking. Uh, for 13 ladies to host a table uh, this year to decorate it uh, with, with the dishes, glasses, silverware, um, 
And you can see Miss Brenda Young in the back today for questions or if you would like to sign up uh, to host a table. Please understand, too, if you're, if you're signing up to host a table, that doesn't mean you have to fill the table. Um, but you're certainly invited to invite some people to uh, come on out for the ladies' Christmas brunch on Saturday, December 9th. It's going to be a great event, so sign up today. Uh, buy your tickets today to be a part of that. Uh, one last thing, Operation Christmas Child also happening uh, that day with the family Thanksgiving dinner. Sunday the 19th during service is going to be our shoebox dedication Sunday. And so if you have, you're, you're working on getting your shoeboxes ready, uh, that is the Sunday to bring them. So in two weeks, uh, we're going to pray over these shoeboxes. Everybody's going to bring them forward. Uh, it's a great, great Sunday that we you know, have a tradition here at Grace every year. And so uh, please be aware of that. When you come in, you're just going to hold them at your seat, and then we're going to collect them and, and pray over them together during the service. All right, so that's coming up in just a couple weeks. So get your shoe boxes done. Uh, I think there might be some more uh, in the back. If you need shoe boxes, uh, come talk to me, and we'll, we'll get you some. All right? Um, so that's all of our announcements this morning. Uh, as you know, Pastor Patrick is back from deployment, and uh, he and his wife, as he shared last week, uh, went off to Hawaii, uh, to Hawaii to reconnect and to be with one another. They've arrived safely. They're there, and uh, they'll be back with us next Sunday. So you can continue to keep them in prayer as they're away uh, just for a great, uh, refreshing time together. Uh, but uh, you get to hear from me this morning, all right? So uh, we're going to open up the Word. <laughs> uh, we're going to open up the Word together today, and uh, we're going to jump right in. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful this morning to be able to gather together to, to worship you and to study your Word. Father, we thank you uh, for your word. Father, we thank you uh, that not only was it active at one time, but it applies right now here today. Father, we thank you that your word is alive and that we get to hear from you today, even as we read something intended for uh, what audience, we know that it applies for us uh, this morning and beyond. So Father, we just ask that you would be with us now as we open your word, uh, prepare our hearts, prepare our minds for uh, what you have for us today, and it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. So if you have a Bible, you can open up to the book of Ephesians. Uh, we are going to be in chapter 3 this morning. And as you turn there, just to give you a little bit of context about uh, what we're going to be diving into this morning. So the book of Ephesians, specifically chapter 3, uh, what we see beginning in verse 14, uh, we see a prayer that Paul, who's the author of Ephesians, offers up on behalf of the believers in Ephesus, all right? So uh, it was written by Paul about A.D. 62 uh, while he was in prison in Rome, and this letter, again, is written, written to the Gentile believers living in the city of Ephesus, and so we're going to see what he has to say in this prayer on their behalf. So Ephesians 3, verse 14, we're going to read uh, this prayer that Paul offers up. It says this, it says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his Holy Spirit, through his Spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length, and height, and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Verse 20, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church, and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever Amen. So this is a great prayer. It's a powerful prayer that, that Paul offers up. It's a powerful passage of Scripture. And if you notice, the first verse we read, verse 14, he says three words, for this reason. For this reason. Then he goes on to say, I bow my knees before the Father. This is also the same language that he used to open up. If you look up in your Bible to, to verse 1 in chapter 3, it's the same language he used. For this reason reason, all right? And so the question that that begs of us is to ask, okay, for what reason? 
Right? What is he talking about here? And it doesn't take a Bible scholar to know that when you see something like that, when you say for this reason or therefore, we need to know what it's there for. We need to go back and, and get the context of what Paul is, the greater context of what he's talking about uh, in this chapter as he leads up to this prayer that he offers up. All right, And so in the opening of chapter 3, Paul talks about the mystery of Christ and how now God, in verse 6, he allows It says the Gentiles now to be fellow heirs and fellow members of the body, fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. All right, so what Paul does is he just speaks simply to the fact that God is going to take Jew and he's going to take Gentile and he's going to put them together and form one church, one body of Jesus Christ. All right, and so that for this reason, that's what he's talking about. All right, and so now for this reason, that's why he goes into his prayer. A second reason that we can pick up on is that this, this ministry has been entrusted to Paul, right? He's not only received a revelation from God for the church, but he's been given a responsibility to the Gentiles, he shares. All right, look at verse 13, the one that precedes what were our main passages. Therefore, I ask you to not lose heart at my tribulations on your behalf. Why? For they are your glory. Right? So Paul wants the church to be strengthened. He, he, he admittedly, he shares some tribulations, some struggles that he has experienced for the sake of Christ, for the, for the simple fact that he is promoting the truth of the gospel and, and people don't like that and they are persecuting him. But he says, be strengthened, not discouraged, right? Even as they go through trials, even as they go through difficulties, just as Paul has shared that he's gone through, he wants them to be encouraged. He just says, do not lose heart. Why? Because you're persevering for Christ, all right? And so we know the reason that the mystery is revealed to the Gentiles, but again, keep in mind that Paul, as he writes this, where is he at? He's in prison, right? But the thing that we see through Paul in in this book and in many others is that he had a little bit of a different perspective toward his own imprisonment, right? He had probably a different, better perspective than I would have if I was in prison, okay? Paul viewed his imprisonment differently, right? Verse 1, he describes himself not as a prisoner of the land, not as a prisoner under the Roman Empire, but a prisoner of who? Of Christ. He describes himself as a prisoner of Christ, and he does the same thing later on in chapter 4. So physically speaking, we understand that Paul is in prison, but it's this eternal perspective that he has that allows him to view his circumstances differently from the way the world might, all right? So we have to capture this before we can you know, move on to what the rest of the passage shows us, right? The, the context is that he's in prison, physically there, but spiritually, man, it doesn't matter where he's at. It doesn't matter what the world is going to do to him, throw at him, because he is honoring Christ with the life that he's living. It allows him to give glory to God, and not only to give glory to God, but to be used of God mightily, even while he's in prison, in chains, for Christ. And so that's the context that Paul is praying with, right? If you you look at life from from the point of view of a, a spiritual perspective, then that means anything that comes along in this life is an opportunity for, for growth, spiritually, growth in Christ, right? So whether it's a good thing, a bad thing, indifferent, whatever it is, are we viewing the things that we're going through as an opportunity to better strengthen and grow in our relationship with Jesus? And I, I just think that's a question that we should be asking ourselves every day, right? In an eternal perspective lived out here on this side of eternity has that in mind, has God's glory in mind above all else, right? And thus living a life that gives him glory. And if we're focused on any, with an eternal perspective, we're focused on growing into be the people that Christ has allowed us to be, has made us to be, right? So Paul's in prison, but his, his perspective was one of eternal significance. He, he turned his prison into a place of prayer. This is the second time that we see Paul pray in the book of Ephesians. There's power in prayer, and Paul knows that. Can I get an amen? There is power in prayer. He knows that. But do we know that? 
Right, right. Paul's in prison. I'm going to say it 75 times. He's, he's in prison, and yet he knows with an eternal perspective that God's got it, that God is good, and it doesn't matter what the world's going to do. Right? I, I've heard so many stories of people who may be limited physically, yet they're spiritual prayer warriors. Right? Right? They, they go before the Lord boldly in prayer. And so let that be a challenge to all of us. Like Whatever our circumstances might be, However difficult they may be, you can still pray. And, and, and through prayer, what's cool is that we go before God. Like, have you ever thought about, like, just how amazing that is, that our, our prayer is, is between us and the God of this universe? And we have an opportunity to do that 24-7, to go before God. All right, again, this is the second of, of two great prayers that Paul offers up. Why does he pray? Is it just because he wants us to think that he's... All that and more, no, like it, he prays because he knows there's value in prayer. He knows that God can do something about what he's praying about, right? We trust in the power of prayer because we know the source that it comes from. It's through God. And with God, all things are possible, all right? And so now I want us to notice really just Paul's attitude, his, his whole response as he, as he prays as a result of what Christ has done his response through this prayer is one of humility. Right? Early on in chapter 3, he reflects on what Christ has done. He points out that the mystery of God that is revealed in Christ, and, and what does he do in verse 14? He, he falls on his knees. Right? He, he humbles himself before God. He's overwhelmed with all that God has done, and so the natural response that he has physically is to, is to get on his knees in reverence of who God is, and what he's done. And, and to me, that's just a perfect picture of what, what Christianity is supposed to look like, of, of what being a follower of Jesus is supposed to look like. Right? Paul's doing this. Again, he says, for this reason, I get on my knees and pray. For this reason, because of what Christ has done, I'm going to pray to him and give glory to him and humble myself before him. Right? Christianity, it's to live a life in response to what he has done for us. We're followers of, of Christ. All right? And then notice again the, the person that he prays to in this prayer. He says, I, I, I bow my knees to the Father. More, some versions say that I, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? He, he approaches God the Father in prayer. So when we become a child of God, when we recognize and accept Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior, then we have the opportunity to access God through the mediating work of Christ. First Timothy chapter 2 says that there is one mediator between God and man, and that is the man, Jesus Christ. He's our mediator. He gives us access to God. He, he bridges the gap between a holy and righteous and blameless and perfect God and sinners like us. He, he bridges the gap for us. Right? Once you accept Christ as Lord and Savior, once you begin a relationship with him, you know, God is restored your relationship, right? He's able to give us access to God the Father as we approach him. And then verse 15, it says, the Father from, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. And, and right there, I just see the context of what we're talking about. Early verse 6, it says, between Jews and Gentiles. Now we see that this family is, is just the family of God, those that have accepted Christ, including both Jews and Gentiles. The mystery has been revealed to all. So Paul offers up this prayer on behalf of, of the Ephesian believers, and he offers it up to the one true God who is head over the church, head over one body and one family in Christ. All right? And so before we get to the heart of the passage, we first have to look at just the very first verse. He, he goes before God humbly. He, he assumes a position of, of humility as he goes on his knees, and, and the person that he approaches is the one true God. Now, in verse 16, we really get to the heart of what Paul's prayer is and, and, and the point of his prayer. All right, we see four specific requests that Paul has on, on behalf of the church, but what we also know is that they're all, they're all connected. E each prayer that Paul offers it really stems from the one that comes before it. All right, so four prayer points, four things that if lived out properly, they make up a healthy believer, and if lived out in the church, they make up uh, what we would describe as a healthy 
church. And all four of these are indicated in these next few verses by the word that. All right? He says that this, this would happen. All right? So the first one is verse 16. It says that he, God, would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. So the first thing that he's praying for is that they would be strengthened with power. Not just anyone's power, but his power. That's the prayer for the, for the Ephesian believers in this passage. Now remember verse 13, he, said, he challenges them to not give up. He, he didn't want them to quit. He didn't want them to throw in town. He says, do not lose heart at my tribulations. And so coming out of that, he logically prays for strength. Right? In order to, to, to not be you know, messed up by the fact that, like, man, look at what Paul's going through. Look at what he's enduring. I wonder what's coming for us. Like, in order to not be messed up by that, we must pray for strength and wisdom that comes from God to allow us to continue doing what he's called us to do. He prays for strength that comes from above, right? Paul mentions his sufferings in, in this passage, and in light of that, he's praying that God would give them power by his spirit. As believers in Jesus Christ, what we, you know, how we can apply this today, what we need to acknowledge is that the Holy Spirit is there for us, right? The Holy Spirit is our, is our help, helper. He's our advocate. We can rely on him. We can trust in him. We can go to him and walk according to the power that he deserves to have in our life, right? We aren't made to go through the Christian life on our own, and yet way too often we, we kind of try to do that, don't we? Way too often we say, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and, you know, make it happen. Rather than just going to God and pressing into his Holy Spirit and allowing him to work within us. Right? Not only does he reside in us, right? Scripture tells us that we've been sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit at salvation. But now we have to let him work and move and do what he wants to in us. He wants to be at work. In a, in, a, in a message I heard this week, they said that, that the Christian life is not hard to live. It is impossible to live apart from the power and strength of the Holy Spirit. It's not hard to live. It's impossible to live without the power and strength of the Holy Spirit. And so, church, are we relying and allowing the Holy Spirit to have power in and through our lives? We rely on the Holy Spirit, it says, to, to strengthen us with power in our inner man. And so what is our inner man? Well, that relates to our spiritual life, right? The Holy Spirit in us relates to our spiritual life. And it's in contrast, inner man, it's in contrast to the outer man, right? So while the outer man is wasting away, we see in Scripture, our inner man is being renewed daily. 2 Corinthians 4, 16, therefore we do not lose heart. Same thing, Paul's off there with that one too, right? Don't lose heart. But even though your outer man is, is, is decaying, fading away, our inner man is being renewed day by day, right? We see a strong connection between what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3 and what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Don't lose heart. Rely on the Holy Spirit who's at work within you day by day, right? It's the same concept. He grants us renewal and strength by the Holy Spirit. Colossians chapter 3, a similar thing, says to, to, to put on the new self, being renewed in knowledge according to the image of the one who created us. All right, so the first thing we see is that a healthy church, a healthy believer, is an individual who is strengthened with the power of the Holy Spirit. All right, we get the second one in verse 17. Paul says that Christ may dwell in their hearts through faith. The, the, the prayer point is that it's Christ indwelling. Right? He says that Christ may indwell in our hearts. Now, again, like we just alluded to, as followers of Jesus, we acknowledge the fact that the Holy Spirit of God resides in us at the moment of our salvation. But this isn't a one-time decision to follow Christ, right? It goes beyond that. So the prayer is for Christ's continual indwelling by the Holy Spirit in the life of of a believer, right? The Holy Spirit takes up residence in our hearts, but he wants to, to come into our lives and, and, and change us from the inside out to shape us into the people that he wants us to be, all right? So, so this process of the Holy Spirit continually indwelling within us, right? It's the, the process of sanctification, right? He wants you to be sanctified. He wants you to be set apart 
This is not salvation. Salvation is instantaneous. In a moment, when you, when you accept Christ, when you go from death to life, when you go from, from darkness and into the light, you are saved. You are born again. You are a believer in Christ. But now this process that he's speaking to the church here is the process of sanctification, being made more like Christ, growing and maturing into the person that he's called you to be, and that's a process, right? That doesn't, I mean, if I can't get an amen on that, like that doesn't happen like in an instant, right? We might accept Christ, but it takes a while, an eternity, in fact, to get to where he wants you to be ultimately, right? We, we, we understand that. It's a process. Like, okay, um, you know, and I think that that's a key thing for us. It's not just that we have Christ in us, but it's, it's that Christ would have his way in us. And too often, I think we ignore the, the sanctification piece of this, right? We, we acknowledge that we have salvation, and sometimes we can treat that as a license to do what we want to do, right? I've, I've heard too many times people, you know, say, well, once saved, always saved, I'm good, right? But is that really what, what he's calling you to, to, to do and who he's calling you to be? Right? It's not a license to do whatever we want to do, to live however we want to live. You know, sometimes it's, all right, Christ, come into my life, come into my heart, but just, just don't mess anything up. Don't change this or that. I'm going to do it my way here, and you can have your way sometimes when I allow you to. All right, don't mess anything up. Don't change things. Are we really treating our relationship with Christ that way? You know, we, we kind of treat his indwelling in us, like when we have guests over to our house, right, we say, make yourself at home. And you're laughing because we don't really mean to make yourself at home when we, when we welcome guests over. Right? Like I can promise you that when you have guests over to your house, you don't really mean that. And you don't want to know what they're like in their home. Like, let's just be honest. Um, but that's kind of how we treat Christ indwelling in us. So the question is, when we let Christ in, as if, you, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have, what does it really look like? What does it actually look like in your own life? Does it, does it mean you invite Christ in and allow him to, to do those things, to, to change you from the inside out, or, or do you put a limit on what you allow him to do? Right? As he takes up residence and, and, and dwells within you, within your heart, do you limit what you're allowing God to have access to? Are you letting him have your whole life? Are you inviting him him and say, make yourself at home in me, change everything you want so that I may be more like Christ, the person that I'm called to be like? So what are we doing when we, when we let Christ in to our lives? What does that really look like? So Christ in dwelling. Thirdly, verse 17, a healthy church, a healthy believer is one that is rooted and grounded in love. He says that you would be rooted and grounded in love. He prays that the church would, would know the love of Christ, not just to have it in their hearts, but to experience it and have it be a foundation for their lives, <clears throat> to be rooted and grounded in love. Think about like a giant oak tree, right? That, that tree that we see above the surface is not what it is without what's happening below the surface, right? Beneath the surface, underground, within the root system, that's what allows the tree that we see to be as beautiful as it is, to be as strong and healthy as it is, because it's rooted and grounded, right? Just like we need to be rooted and grounded in the love of Christ, which has set us free. That needs to be our foundation. I, I love Psalm 1 that talks about a tree being, being planted, right? He, it says, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. Psalm 1, verse 2, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaves do not wither, and in whatever he does, he prospers. Right? A, a tree that is firmly rooted and planted in Christ's love is going to prosper. Right? If we're doing what he's called us to do, being who he's called us to be, he's going, he's going to prosper through us. 1 John 4, verse 9, it says, The love of God was manifested in us, but God has sent his only begotten son into the world 
so that we may live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So that love that God has for us, that, that Christ demonstrated for us by dying for us, that should drive us. Right? We should be rooted and grounded in this love that Christ has displayed. Right? And, and, and if any group of people should be displaying or living in or being rooted in the love of Christ, it's the church of Jesus Christ. Because we're commanded to in the Bible. Right? We should be able to expect the church, to, the church of Jesus Christ to show a sense of, of love. Right? We really need to be effective in communicating love for one another in this body of believers. Right? Our, our motto here at Grace is, is that we're a place to call home. All right? and, and we desire for everyone who walks in those doors, whether it's for the first time or the hundredth time or the one thousandth time, to, to feel at home here in, in this body. And that's not possible if we're not rooted and grounded in love as a church. All right, what we've seen in the scriptures that this love that we're called to exist in is a self-sacrificing love. So in John chapter 13, 13, Jesus commands his disciples to love one another just as I have loved you, he says. And, and how did he just show love for them? Well, in, chapter, in that same chapter, he loved them by serving them. Earlier in that chapter, he, he washes his disciples' feet. Right? Love one another just as I have loved you. How have I displayed that love for you? I've, I've, I've cared for you. I've served you. I've washed your feet. Right? And as the church, we can give evidence to those around us, to our neighbors around us, that Grace Gospel Church is rooted and grounded in love. Because that's the church that we're called to be. Right? An, an event like we just did Tuesday night, Trunk or Treat. You know, over 300 guests on our property. And, and an event like that does not happen if, we, if we're not capturing this idea that we're rooted and grounded in love, right? We, we do an event like that to, to be the hands and feet of Jesus, but to show them that we have come to know and experience the love that God has for us, and that love that God has for us is, is available for them to tap into as well, right? The gospel is for everybody. That's why, again, in the context of Ephesians chapter 3, for Jew and for Gentile, Christ died for all. That's what we recognize, all right, so verse 18, being rooted and grounded in love, you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth of the love of Christ, right? His love is so great. And he spends time talking about that to believers that have come to know that love. In verse 19, it, it's his prayer that they would know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. And I want you to just pick up on that real quick. So he wants them to know a love that surpasses knowledge. Anybody? He wants them to know something that you can't know. <laughs> he wants them to know something that's unknowable. He wants them to know a love that surpasses knowledge, surpasses comprehension. How does he say that? I really don't know. All right. But Paul recognizes, obviously, that he's attempting to measure something that's not measurable. He prays for the Ephesian Christians that they would, in fact, come to know this love that ultimately is unknowable. But, but through the indwelling of Christ, we, we know that we are given insight into this love and understanding, of, you know, understanding heart to know and experience this love that is boundless, that is limitless, right? We've experienced the love that God has for us. And we're to know that and have that drive everything that we do. All right, so fourthly, the fourth point, uh, major point here is that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Verse 19, you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. And when you look at that, when you just read that on the screen, like that's a pretty tall order. All right, to be filled up to all the fullness of God. Well, what does this mean? So in other places in Scripture... You know, the fulfillment that God intends for man is maturity that is measured by the full stature of Christ. Ephesians chapter 4, the next chapter, verse 12, it says, For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the service, to the building up of the body of Christ, verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure 
of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. All right, so we're, we're measuring to Christ. A mature man is one that measures of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. So as Christians, we aspire to be like Christ. That's something that we should be chasing after daily. Again, in this process of Christ indwelling us, right, you notice how they connect, Christ indwelling, and now we're made to be more like Christ, to chase after full, the full measure of perfection that's found in him. Right, he's the one we're, we're chasing after. You know, maybe you've heard or seen some people from time to time, or maybe it's been you from time to time when we play this kind of comparison game to our neighbors, to our coworkers, to our family members, to our friends, whoever it is, to someone you see on TV. And oftentimes when we play a comparison game, it's to make ourselves look better. You kind of, kind of know what I'm talking about. Um, well, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. I haven't done what they've done. I haven't sinned like they are. Look at what they're doing. And we measure ourselves against people who are sinners just like we are. We're called to chase after Christ. Why do we do that? Right? Why, do we, why do we seek to just be better than that person when really we should be chasing after the perfection that Christ is? Right? Like, I might have issues, but I'm not as bad as they are. Have you seen them? But that's not, the per- that's not biblical. That's not the person we're supposed to be measuring up to. Um, you know, last year, maybe the year before, in our men's ministry, we were reading a book called Respectable Sins. Um, and in the title alone, it, it, it's catchy. But what it's about is, you know, this idea that even as followers of Jesus, we tend to look more intently, be more focused on some of the major sins, the bad sins in this world, and we do a little less with our own sins and our own problems. They're a little more respectable. They're a little more okay. I'm a little more all right because no one knows about what's going on in my life, and they're not as bad as what they're doing, right? We, we, we do that. We, we, we do that all the time. But the reality is what Scripture teaches us is that sin is sin, right? Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It doesn't matter what category of sin, you fall short of God's glory. Sin is sin, and it needs to be dealt with. And oftentimes, just, you know, sometimes because there's more public sins or more things that are are, are like really, really, really bad means that we, we justify it in our own life and think, well, my little problems, you know, I'm all right. It doesn't have to be dealt with. We look at it, we gloss over it. It's fine. I'm good. Right? Or sometimes we think that God doesn't, God doesn't even have time to deal with my little thing. Like, look, what he, look what's going on in the world. <laughs> you know? I mean, how often do we try and justify it that way, that way by thinking that God's not, he's not concerned about that? Yes, he is. Yes, he is. He calls you to be like Christ. And, and whatever sin it is, it's not Christ-like. It doesn't matter, period, right? Philippians 3, Paul says, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So he says, press on. Pursue the upward call in Christ. Be filled with the fullness of God, as it says in our passage, right? And not that we're filled with all of God, right? Because he's infinite. Like, that's impossible. But God's fullness is the source for us. As God's people, we have God dwelling in us in all his fullness. Praise God. Praise God. Like, like we're able to overcome these shortcomings, these failures, these mishaps that we have that are sinful, that are wrong because of his spirit that's indwelling in us, right? If we are rooted and grounded in love, we know that he's within us, then we can get through it, right? And we can, we can point out sin in our own lives and do something about it that's going to honor Christ, all right? And then the chapter closes, verses 20 and 21. Uh, Paul wraps it up. He, he gives praise to the one who is able. I love how he ends, right? We've, 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 you may have been familiar with this passage before, but it says, Now to him who is able to do what? Far more abundantly, exceedingly above and beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. To him who is able to do far more abundantly, exceedingly beyond all that we ask or think. That's a lot. Like, that's a mouthful. One. Two, that's a big deal. He 
is able to do more than we ask him or think. He alone is worthy to be praised. He alone is able forever and ever. All right, with that, far more abundantly than we ask or think, kind of like Isaiah 55, when God, God says, my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Right, he is able. And so when we pray, we must know, as Paul knows, because he prays it, that God is able. But again, I love the verse, verse 20, a familiar one, but, but in the context here, again, Paul has just ran through f- four prayer requests on behalf of this church, and he's going before God with these requests, and he, and he does this with confidence. Right? He, he knows he's praying again to a God that can provide, a God that can heal, a God that can help, a God that can, can cure. Right? He knows that God is capable to do just you know, some things with the situation. No, he, he knows that God is capable to go above and beyond anything that Paul can ask or think. Do we pray like that? I mean, really, like, do we pray? Do we say, God, you, you, can, you can do above and beyond anything that I'm even asking you to do for your will and your plan for, for this situation, right? Do we recognize that we are going before the one who is able? Or is he just one of the sources that we try to make, you know, fi- help fix the situation? Or, or do we recognize he is the one? He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. God the Father, he is the one that, can, that is able, that can help, that can minister to me, that can heal. He is able. Right? If, if we're having problems at home, he is able. Problems with finances, he is able. Problems with health, God is able. And not only is he able, but verse 21, he alone, because of his ability, is to receive the glory for what he's going to do in the situation, whatever it is. Right? This whole prayer that Paul has, and what we just read as we break it down, it comes as a result of what Christ has done. It says in verse 6, Jews and Gentiles, fellow heirs, members of the body, and fellow partakers of the promise of Christ Jesus through the gospel. And so because of that, Paul responds in prayer. And so I just want to kind of just to sum it all up, you know, to, to pose each of these points for us as individuals as questions, all right? So there's four prayer points that, that Paul introduces here, but the question that we need to have as a result of how Paul responds, Paul responds in humility, Paul responds with praise, Paul responds with prayer, how are we responding to what Christ has done? Paul responds in humility, right? He humbles himself before the Lord. So the question there is, are we humbling ourselves daily before the Lord as we go to him in prayer, right? Secondly, Paul prays for for power that is given through the Holy Spirit. And the question there is, are we relying on and trusting in the Holy Spirit and his power in our lives? Are we allowing him to not just take up residence in us as believers, but to actually work within us and move through us? Are we allowing for that to happen, right? Paul prays that Christ would continually indwell in the believers. Are we praying that God would work within us, that he would change us from the inside out, that he would be allowed to have his way in our lives? Or are we still kind of on the throne and kind of dictating where God's going to be able to to factor into our equation? Are we relying on trusting the Holy Spirit? Are we praying that God would work within us? And he prays that the, the church would be rooted and grounded and love. So are we, are we driven by Christ's love in everything that we do, right? We love because he first loved us, First John says. All right, Paul prays that the church would be filled up to all the fullness of God. Are we, are we striving to be more like Christ, or are we striving to be better than our neighbor? All right? Continual growth, being filled with more of him and less of us. And the end of his prayer, he gives praise to the one who is able Are we praising him every day for his goodness, his faithfulness, knowing, knowing that he is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think? And then he ends his prayer recognizing that that God alone is the worthy recipient of all the glory, right? And so the question there is, are we doing the same? Are we 
making sure that he receives all the glory in, in this church? Are we making sure that he receives all the glory in our own lives for whatever it is that he's doing, however he's moving, are we making sure that he receives the glory because he alone is worthy? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you this morning that we get to dive into your word. Father, we thank you for this prayer that we read that, that Paul offers up on behalf of uh, the Ephesian believers and, and, he, and he prays to the one true God. He prays to the one who is able. And Father, in our, in our own lives, we recognize you know, some, some, some of these areas that we just went through and, and how we fall short in many. Father, we ask that you would have your way in us. We ask that we would reflect on the ways in which we can allow not only for you to dwell in us as believers, but for you to work in us, for you to move how you desire to move, and, and, and quite frankly, that we would just get out of the way of ourselves and of the mission that you are fulfilling in this world and the mission that you are calling us to, to partake in with you. Father, help us, guide us, lead us. Help us to know the power of your Holy Spirit that is at work within us. Father, help us to be a church. Help us to be a people. Help us to be individuals that are rooted and grounded in your love for us. Father, we know that it is through your love that we are here right now in this church, a church that is rooted and grounded in your love. Help us to be people that recognize that every day. Help us to live for you every day in every way so that you alone would receive the glory that you are due. Father, because it's not about us, it's not about my power, it's about your power in us. Father, may we just be obedient, may we be willing instruments, willing vessels to be used of you mightily in building your kingdom. Father, we love you, we thank you, we praise you in Jesus' name, amen. Will we all rise, please?
You know, Troy was uh, in his sermon, he said it a few times, <clears throat> the words getting changed from the inside out. God put it on my heart this week. I was praying about what songs to, uh, to choose this week, and uh, we haven't played it in years, but God definitely told me to put this into the set, and uh, it's a great song. It's asking Jesus to take a foothold into your life. Letting, asking the Holy Spirit to come into your hearts, into your minds, and change you, because it can't be from the outside in. You know, you could do a lot of good things on the outside, but is your heart changed? And that's what he's looking for. So when you invite him in, it's from the inside. And you bring him into your heart and your life, you'll naturally do the things that are on the outside. times I feel still your mercy remains should I stumble looking I'm calling your grace everlasting your light is shining on earth's face never ending your glory goes beyond our faith
Father God, we thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness and your love for us. God, we, it is a fitting song. God, we desire to be changed from the inside out. God, we pray that you would come into our lives and, and have your way. Father, not just when it's convenient for us, not just when it's in our, you know, interests or what we want, you know, selfishly, but God, may you have your way in everything, in every area, every time. Father, may we press in, may we trust in, in your perfect plan, your will in our lives. Father, we thank you for your goodness, your grace, your mercy, and the love that you have shown toward us, Father, that you call us to operate within, to, to operate within your love and to show your love to those around us. Father, help us to do that. Father, we love you, we thank you, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, one of the ministries that we have here at Grace is uh, Prayer Partners uh, Ministry, and so uh, my wife, Michaela, and myself, we are prayer partners this morning. If you need prayer or would like to pray with someone, uh, other than that, I know the ladies' Christmas brunch, that's a month away. Sign up for a table, uh, sign up to attend and, and purchase your tickets today, and other than that, you are dismissed. Have a great day. Mm-hmm.